Good morning. We are currently in a series, and I told you it didn't really originally plan to be a series. If you recall, back about three weeks ago, I, I spoke about what passion is, what passion in your life is, what passion for God is, and where that comes from, how we work on it. Um, and then the weeks after that, didn't plan it like this, but the way it happened, um, talking about the passion killers. What is it that we, as individuals, we, what are we doing to contribute to, what are we allowing in our lives to kill our passion? Our passion for life, yes, but more importantly, our passion for God and His will in our life. Over the last two weeks, I've given you three passion killers. The first one I talked about was an unbalanced schedule. Last week, I spoke about your unused gifts or talents. And then I talked about unconfessed sin. Passion killers. You know, as Christians, one of the things that we should have and, and develop and grow in is our passion for God. Our passion for life. Our passion for His will in our life. But too often, we allow. Maybe we don't even realize it. But we allow. And we contribute to the passion killers that rob us of that. Today I've got two more passion killers for you. But before I get started, I want to tell you something. I realize that there are times that it can be hard to sit there and listen to the subject matter that I might be speaking on. I realize it's not always going to be comfortable. I realize you can go to another church and you can get a, a feel-good message about every single Sunday. So with that being said, if you need a preacher that's easy on the ears... You need a preacher to make you feel comfortable all the time. If you need a preacher that's going to preach a feel-good message every single Sunday, well, that's not me. I'm not going to be that man. I'm not that man. I'm not going to be that man. The older I get, and the more I grow in my relationship with God, the more I realize that this life is very, very, very short. Jesus is coming back real, real, real soon. And it don't do any one of us any good if I'm sugarcoating stuff. You need to know it. I need to know it. We need to know it. And we need to know it before it's too late. I just want to get that out of the way. Are you ready to get your toe stepped on now? I've titled today's message, No Room for Conflict and Isolation. Let's open with a word of prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, I do thank you so much for this day. A day to celebrate our Father. A day to come together as a family and celebrate you. To give you the honor, to give you the glory. It has nothing to do with us. Us being here today has nothing to do with us. It's all about coming and saying, thank you, Daddy. Thank you, Father, God, for who you are. Thank you that you are in control, that all our hope is in you and nothing else. Lord, as I always pray, have the Holy Spirit move over this place. Move over every individual, Lord. Have them hear what you want them to hear, not what I'm saying. That's so important. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's the very first passion killer I want to talk about this morning. Things that we either are contributing to or we're allowing to happen in our life that is robbing us of the passion for life, but more importantly, the passion for God and His will in our life. The very first one, unresolved conflict. Unresolved conflict. One of the things I've come to know and realize that conflict will drain the passion from your life. It'll take it from you. It'll strip it from you. I got to ask you a question, though, before I get started. Have you ever got out of bed in the morning and just knew it was going to be a great day? It might not happen all the time. 
But one of those days, you wake up and you know it's going to be a great day. From the moment you open your eyes, you can just feel it. It's going to be good. It's going to be great. You go through that morning and you're pumped up. You're energized and you don't even know exactly why. You just know this is going to be an amazing day. It's going to be great. You get ready, you get dressed, you you shower, or you should shower first. Shower, get dressed, and then you eat. Don't do that the opposite. That's that's one, that's really a great day. Uh, You do all of that, you're on the verge of walking out the door to start that great day. And then you might have the argument or a fight with your husband or your wife or your children. And that great day just went to a bad day. It sucks the air right out of you. You know what I'm talking about? Huh? That's what conflict does. It takes all the passion that you've got. The love that you've got. That energy that you've got. That excitement that you've got. And it strips it right out of you. Like that. You go from being full of energy, full of excitement, full of passion to low and flat in a matter of minutes. We've all experienced it. You know what I'm talking about, whether you're shaking your head or not. Some of you are in situations right now at home, at work, maybe at school, where the conflict is constant. Is what it is. I ain't sugarcoating it. Some of you right now are living with conflict. And say, okay, preacher, well, how do I, how do, how do I keep that from myself? How, how do I keep that from robbing that passion? How, how do I keep that from robbing my joy? Well, I'm glad you asked. You have to make the decision to protect yourself from the three passion killing emotions and i'm going to talk about them today the things that keep you from having that passion for god passion for his life or his will in your life passion for living you need to understand something i've said this before you cannot control the other person that might be giving you the issues. You can only control your actions. You can only control your reactions. And get this. Here's where I'm going with this. You can only control your emotions. The emotions that come from conflict. The three emotions that kill our passion because of conflict are these right here. You ready? Resentment, jealousy, and anger. Resentment, jealousy, and anger. If you've got your Bibles with you, turn to Job chapter 5, verse 2. Job comes right before the book of Psalms. Job chapter 5, verse 2. Thank you, brother. And it would help if I'm not in Esther. Job chapter 5, verse 2. Anybody else got it? Says this. Resentment kills the fool. And jealousy kills the simple. Do me a favor, circle or underline that word resentment and jealousy. You got it? You got it? All right. Do me a favor. Now let's flip to the right over to Job chapter 18, verse 4.
Let me know when you got it. It says this, You who tear yourself to pieces in your anger. Underline that word, your. You who tear yourself to pieces in your anger. Is the earth to be abandoned for your sake? Or must the rocks be removed from their place? Let me summarize this one for you. Here it is. You're only hurting yourself with anger. That's what he's getting at right there. The only person you're hurting with anger or prolonged anger is yourself. Circle that word anger. Those three things that I just asked you to circle are the three passion killing emotions that you're allowing or you're contributing to. And get this, it only hurts you. It's only hurting you. Resentment. Anger. Jealousy. And get this. You make the decision, whether you realize it or not, you are making the decision to have resentment, to be jealous, and to have anger, or prolonged anger even. And get this. You also make the decision to let them go. To forgive. That's why forgiveness is so important. God never intended us to carry around resentment. Never intended for us to carry around anger and jealousy. If you're holding on, if you're somebody here today or you're watching on the internet and you're, you're holding on to resentment. You're holding on to that jealousy. You're holding on to that anger against somebody else because something they did or how they've treated you. It's only hurting you. It's only hurting you. It's not hurting the person you're resentful against or you're angry with or you're jealous of. It's not hurting them. Chances are, well, the majority of the time that I've dealt with this with an individual or individuals, most of the time, the person that you're resenting, the person that you're angry with, the person that you're jealous of, they don't even know it. They ain't got a clue. They don't even know you're angry with them. They don't even know you're jealous. They don't even know you resent them. That anger, it hurts you. That jealousy, it hurts you. That resentment, it's hurting you. If you want the passion for life, if you want the passion for God and God's will in your life to be restored in your heart, in your life, for God, then you got to forgive. You got to forgive. You got to let it go. And I know what some of you are thinking. Let them off the hook. How can I do that? How am I going to let them off the hook? Preacher, you don't know what they said to me. You don't know what they did to me. You don't know how they treated me. How in the world am I going to let them off the hook? I'm not telling you to let them off the hook. I'm telling you to put, put them on God's hook. You take them off of your hook that you're holding on to and you turn them over to God. And you let Him take care of it. You say, God, I, I don't want this anymore. God, I can't take this anymore. God, this is stealing. It's robbing my passion for life, for living for you, for your will in my life. I don't want this anymore. I want that passion to be restored. So I'm taking them off of my hook and I'm putting them on yours. I'm letting you deal with it. Now, there might be many of you sitting here today and you say, well, that's a good preaching there, preacher. 
But I'm not, I'm not a resentful person. I'm not an angry person. I'm not jealous at all. What about that politician or that elected official you can't stand and you're always talking bad about? Hmm? What about the people caught up in sin that you're always talking bad about? What about the people that you talk about on social media? You say, preacher, that don't count. <laughs> yes, it does. What about the person that pulled out in front of you two weeks ago and you're still talking about him? That woman, you was trying to shop and, and the woman cut in front of you in the line. And it's been two months and you're still talking about her. You might not care for the politician, the elected official. The person that's living in sin. That it's easy to condemn. Listen, we hate the sin, we love the sinner. You cannot have the love that God wants for you to have for everybody else if you're hanging on to resentment, jealousy, and anger. That's for Christians. If you don't forgive that person, let go of that jealousy, let go of that anger, let go of that resentment, then let me tell you something, that anger, that jealousy, that resentment that you've got for somebody else that don't know it, is controlling your passion. And in turn, is controlling your life. Think about it. The person or the people that you resent, that you're jealous of, that you're angry with, are controlling your life. And chances are, they don't even know it. You're allowing somebody to control your life based off of your anger, your jealousy, and your resentment. They're controlling your life and they don't even know it. Forgive and let go. Notice I didn't say forgive and forget. We forgive. The only person that can't forget or does forget, excuse me, is God. We use that. We forgive and then we use that as a spiritual growth. You don't turn around and put yourself back into spiritual harm. You learn from it. You forgive and you let go. That's how you resolve the conflict in your heart. That's how you regain that passion for life, your passion for God. Somebody say amen. That's good preaching, preacher. All right. Thank you. I can talk about this subject matter for a long time. This one's near and dear to my heart. But I got another one. This is the fifth one that we're uh, talking about. Unsupported lifestyle. An unsupported lifestyle. Sometimes you lose passion for God because you're not spending time around the people, the Christians, in godly fellowship. You're not spending time around other Christians. You're not getting into the fellowship. The family. The reason God put us together. Every single person here. Do you realize that you're here because God has led you here? Do you realize that? You can shake your head. We've done this last couple of Sundays. Yeah, this means yes. This means no. I don't know what this means. Something in the middle. God has you as an individual, specifically you, here for a reason, here for a purpose. Turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 4, 9 through 10. It comes right after the book of Proverbs. Just a few books to the right. 4, Ecclesiastes 4. 9 through 10. I love this scripture, this verse. Now, I usually read this verse. I've, many times have I read this verse in a marriage, in a marriage ceremony. And we often relate this to a husband and a wife. And it does. And it, 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 it does. I mean, we're talking about a husband and wife. But it also refers 
to godly brothers and sisters. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 10. You got it? Two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. We need each other. Amen? We don't like to always admit it, but we do. Why? Because we all fall sometimes, do we not? Now, I got an amen on the one before. We just go, uh, yeah. We all fall sometimes, don't we? We all stumble sometimes, don't we? We need people in our lives to help us up. I want to tell you something that's very, 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 very important. You ready? It's very important for you as a Christian to be in a small Christian group. Christian fellowship with a small group. Sunday school class. Wednesday night Bible study. Men's fellowship. Ladies fellowship. Youth group. Bible study of your own maybe that you're putting on there at your house. They are extremely, extremely, extremely important for your spiritual growth. But you need them for another reason. Very important reason. This life that we live is full of highs and lows. And you need to be connected to people that know who you are and know your needs. You say, well, I thought that's what the church is for. It is. It is. But I also know that there are many of you here this morning that are sitting here and you don't know the man or the woman that's two or three rows in front of you. Or the man or woman or child that's sitting two or three rows behind you. Or the one that's all the way over on the left or the one that's all the way on the right. I can't hardly keep all y'all straight. So I know what I'm talking about. You're going to go through highs and you're going to go through lows in this life. And you need to be connected to people that know who you are and what you need. Small groups are where you connect. Small groups are where your fellowship is. Small groups are where you grow in the family of God. It's where you find your support system. I don't need to tell you. Most of you know this. Crisis comes. It does. This life's highs and lows. You're going to have crisis in this life. Don't wait until the crisis happens before you think, I needed a support system. I needed a small group I could be in. I needed to be connected to some people. Because when that crisis comes, you're not going to have the time for that to happen. It's in those moments, it's in those crises where those individuals just flock to you. You're going to go through those highs. You're going to go through those lows. You need to be connected. Find a small group. If you say, well, there's not one that fits my taste. Start one in your house. Start a Bible study in your house. Get connected with other brothers and sisters in Christ in a small group. Get involved in that group. Find that support system in your life. And in this support system, guess what's going to happen? You're going to be in a small group, a support system that's going to share the same passions for God. The same passions for your will, for excuse me, God's will in your life. Even in the difficult times. But don't get me wrong, those small groups are not just for the difficult times. They're also for the good times, the celebratory times. You see, it's in the good days, it's in your good days, when you're the one that can be lifting somebody else up. You remember the message I preached about two weeks ago, talking about that giving and that receiving? That balanced lifestyle? Christian life is all about, yes, it is about receiving, but at the same time, it's giving back. 
somebody can help me up when I'm down. And when I'm having a good day, I can turn around and help somebody else up. That's who we are as a church, as a body of Christ, as a small group. Human beings were created for relationships, whether you realize it, agree with it or not. Some of you be like, well, you know what, I'd be all right if I'd just be on my own. God didn't make you that way. God made you to be in a relationship. You know, in a prison, when they want to give somebody the ultimate punishment, you know what they do? They put them in solitary confinement. You know why? They isolate them. Because you're not created to function in isolation. You're not created to function that way. You were made for relationships. You were created by God to be around other people. I know some of you. Oh, man. We were. We are. God did. That's how God created us. That's how God made us. Whether you're married or you're single, you need relationships. Why not make them godly relationships? Get involved in small groups to have that support system. Having been a pastor now for about well, seven years, next month, I've seen a lot of people continue in their passion for God, strong passion for God, strong passion for God's will in their life, strong passion for life in general. And I've seen a lot of people lose that passion for God, that passion for living, that passion for God's will in their life. And those of those, those that have lost that passion for God, it's actually become pretty predictable. It's a predictable pattern. You can see the same type of pattern happening every single person. The first thing that happens is the person stops coming to church. Now, I'm not talking about the ritual of coming to church. I'm talking about they draw back from their relationships with people within the church. They draw back from those relationships of small groups. And then they draw back from coming to church. And there's a lot of reasons, a lot of reasons, I'll call it even excuses, that we tell ourselves for doing this. I'll, be, I'll, I'll tell you, the, the many, 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 many years ago, Sarah and I, we living in North Carolina, and I purposely, from that point on up until I became a preacher, was trying to pull back. You know why? Because relationships are hard. I didn't want to get caught up in all these different relationships. I also knew God had a calling on my life. And I was kind of trying to stay, trying to stay away from it. Thank goodness, thank God that I give in to Him for His will, for His plan, and then watch that passion grow and grow and grow. But a lot of times when we withdraw and we pull back and then we stop coming to church for whatever reasons, and there's a ton of them out there, there's a lot of reasons. Well, it's summer, you know. It's nice outside. I'll come when it's raining. You know, I know there's the sports and the hunting and the, the camping. You know, it's camping season. Whatever the reasons are, you start, start spending time less with other people who have a desire, a passion for God. The next thing that always happens is your heart starts to turn cold. You start to feel far from God. You start to feel like God's far from you. I told you the illustration a couple months back about the, the pastor 
He knew there was a gentleman in his church that stopped coming to church. Hadn't been there for quite some time, so he goes over to his house, and it was a winter night. He had a big fireplace in the house. It was only him, the hearth right there in front. The pastor comes in, he grabs the, the tongs. He reaches in, he grabs that hot coal from the fire. And he pulls it out of the fire, and he sets it on the hearth, and he just sits there and looks at it, and after just a few minutes, that hot coal starts to go dark. It goes completely dark. He grabs it. He sticks it back in the fire. He sits there and looks and looks and looks. And that coal that was black starts to glow red hot again. The pastor looked at the man and said, you have a great day. And walked out. He knew exactly what he was getting at. We have to be around people. We have to be around relationship, godly relationships, around people that can warm us up. That love us and we love them in turn. So that passion can grow. It's a need in all of us. All of us. That's how God designed us as his children. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25, you don't need to turn there. Let me read you this, it says this. Let us consider how we may spur one another towards love and good deeds. Let's not give up meeting together and let us encourage one another. You do that with each other. Passion grows with each other. As I come to a close, I want to tell you a true story. There was a preacher one time, and he interviewed a Christian woman that was on the show Survivor. Everybody knows that show, right? Yeah. Some of you got a big smile on your face. I just mentioned Survivor. That's the biggest smile you had all since I've been talking. <laughs> True story. She'd gone on the show and was told that she could bring five things to the island. She said, one of them I wanted to bring was my Bible. And the producer said, no, you can't, you can't do that. Somebody's already brought a Bible. You need to choose five other things. So she went to the island without her Bible. She also went to the island without Christian brothers and sisters. She didn't have those Christian relationships that I was just talking about. It didn't take long before she said she began to change. She said, my character began to change. She said, the way I talk to others changed. The words I used changed. Ugly words, she said. Words I've never said before. She said her attitude towards others changed. She said, I started feeling jealousy, resentment, and anger towards the other people. She told the pastor that was doing the interview, she said, I didn't realize how weak I really was. She went on to say, the only reason I've grown as a believer is because I've been around other people who are also growing as believers. God made you to be in fellowship with other Christians. And it's very, very important for your passion to grow. Likewise, you'll never have the passion, you'll never have the joy and the excitement that God wants you to have in this life if you cannot forgive and let go. Let's close in prayer. And gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you so much. I thank you, Lord, that, well, that you're God and we're not. I thank you for the things that you have done or doing and you plan to do even when we don't even know them. I'm glad, dear Heavenly Father, for the message that you brought, that you laid on my heart. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that we take this message, we take it out. Let your Holy Spirit be the after preacher today. In Jesus' name, amen.